grace. 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 Okay, last week we were looking at Paul's words to the Philippian church, uh, who said that he wanted them to work out their own salvation with deep respect for God so that Christ would be formed in them and and so that he would not have labored in vain over them. Because remember, that was a big deal. A major point last week was that uh, Christ being formed in us is so central to the gospel and so central to God's purposes of salvation that Paul would have considered everything he did, every letter that he wrote, every visit and every uh, travel that he took and every persecution that he endured to be an absolute total fail and a waste of time if Christ failed to be formed in them. Um, that that just that when you understand, as I know you guys at least have a, a rudimentary and probably a pretty developed understanding of what the life of Paul was like, that's quite the statement. I mean, Paul and Paul's life in comparison to most of ours, as far as being dedicated to spreading the gospel, um, uh, all of ours probably in some way or another pale by comparison to the efforts that were poured into the gospel by this man. And he said it would be, it would all add up to zero or worse than that negative numbers if Christ failed to be formed in those to whom I was sent. So, I mean, that is a huge statement. And if that's not a big, a big confirmation that Christ being formed on us is the heart and the purpose of salvation and the message of the gospel, then I'm not sure what would be. Now, in Paul's encouragements to them, he taught them the nature of our communion with God and with each other. That to love God requires that we love our siblings in Christ. And to fail to love them was also to fail to love God. And going one step further, when we breached over and went into First John last week, he said to hate a sibling in Christ makes it clear that they are not, in fact, your sibling at all, because you clearly don't even know God if you hate your brother. So uh, all of this is pointing out our communion, our koinonia, our shared experience, shared resources, and shared life with Christ, and our brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no difference. You cannot have communion with Christ without having communion with his children, and you cannot have communion with the body of Christ without having communion with God. Um, so... You know, we read in 1 John chapters 1 and 2 about this communion. John said to have communion with each other was to have communion with God as well. It's not like he was saying, you know, because remember he said uh, um, that uh, we've written these things to you so that you might have communion with us. And truly our communion is with the Father. So he, and he said, so... The end, the net result being, if you have communion with us, you are commun having communion with God. And that wasn't true just because John and the others were apostles. It's because they were children of God. So it applies to you and I. If someone has communion with you and I, enters into a shared life, shared experience, and shared resources with you, they are also experiencing Christ. So um, now chapter 2 in First John, uh, we began to see uh, some of the proofs of maturity into Christ's likeness, or how we progressively have Christ's character formed in us as we mature in him. And we'll go ahead and read that again real quick. It's in 1 John chapter 2. Um, and you see a progression from little children to young men to fathers. And these were really not intended to be gender specific. They, uh, they It was just a, a terminology that was used for progression and growth, not so much this wasn't focused on maleness or femaleness. It was just a progression of growing up. So um, there are places where that's important. This is not one of them. Um, so in First John chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. Now, if you remember, one of the last things he just got done dealing with in chapter 1 of First John was that uh, if you claim you don't sin, you're a liar. And if you do sin... All you need to do as a child of God is confess your sin, and God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But, um, but you know, he'd rather that you just don't sin. Um, but he also knows you're gonna from time to time. All of that stressing the point that 
the child of God's walk should progressively get, be getting more and more like Christ and less and less of the world. Sin should get less and less of a grip on them. And so um, even though you are maturing into Christ's image and you're sinning less and less, it doesn't mean you're ever going to stop sinning altogether. And so we need to have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And so after that is when he starts chapter two saying, my little children, I'm writing to these things so that you don't sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the entire world. Meaning anyone can come to God. Anyone can come to God through Christ and their sins be dealt with once for all. Um, so, uh, But also for the whole world. Verse 3. This is how we are sure that we have come to know him. Now, I want you to notice the wording there again. God is so good. This is how we are sure that we've come to know. If that was said in a modern day church, they would say something along the lines of, and you know what I'm about to say, this is how you can be sure you're going to heaven when you die. God, what a cheap way of parsing out the gospel. That is just sick. This isn't about whether we're going to heaven or not going to heaven or, 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 I mean, obviously that's a big deal and it's part of the, uh, it's part of it. That's not the focus. The focus is who we have come to have relationship with. Uh, you know, a, a question that I saw someplace, and I read it to you a few weeks ago, um, I thought was a great question, uh, was um, a personal inventory on if you could go, if you could go to heaven and have everything that you ever wanted, I mean... All of I mean, every need that was ever you ever had was fully met. Every desire you ever wanted was fully realized. Um, every I mean, you it didn't. There was no possible thing that that gave great delight to the soul that was not present in abundance for an eternity. No sickness, none of those things. And Christ was not there. Would it still be heaven to you? And that's really the core of this. Because where we spend eternity, um, I mean, obviously, we don't want to spend eternity in hell in a place of torment. That's obvious. But, but as far as location is of much less importance than with whom. And uh, that's, the, that's the gospel message right there, which is why John didn't ask them, this is how you're sure to know that you're going to heaven when you die. He said, this is how you're sure that you know him, is by keeping his commandments. Verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know God, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, and the word keeps there is the same thing as um, the word walks that we talked about last week. It means a perpetual way of living, okay? doesn't mean they never fall. It just means the general conversation of their life is in union with him. They don't live lives running after sin. So the one who says, I have come to know him without keeping commandments, his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps as a habitual nature God's word, truly in this one, the love of God is perfected. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says that he remains in God should walk just as he walked. Dear friends, I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old commandment that you've had from the very beginning, meaning from the beginning in Judaism. The old command is the message that you have heard. Yet, in a way, I'm writing you a new command, which is true in him, and it's already true in you too, because the darkness is passing away already, and the true light is already beginning to shine in you. The one who says that he is in the light but hates his brother is actually abiding in darkness even to this very moment. The one who loves his brother remains in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and doesn't even know where he's going because the darkness is so completely blinded his eyes. I'm writing to you little children. This is where the progression is the, towards maturity in Christ. I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven on account of his wonderful name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have come to know the one who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, 
because you have had victory over the evil one. Again, he kind of goes through the list again, starting in verse 14. I've written to you children because you have come to know the Father. I've written to you fathers because you have come to know the one who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you are strong and God's word remains in you and you have had victory over the evil one. So I want you to see that that progression there before we go further. Simply put, the maturity goes roughly something like this. Children in Christ know God, meaning that they they at least have the token sign of loving their brother and their sister, which is a proof that they love that they know God. They they on a general basis want to live after God's commands. They're not making it a point to live in sin. They still have got a lot of problems, still still got a lot of sin going on in their life. There's a lot of things that they have not found victory over. They're just stumbling around and asking for forgiveness, stumbling around and, oh, Father, I'm sorry I did it again. And, oh, God, I love you. I love you. I love you. I don't want to do it again. Oops, I did it again. God, I'm sorry. That's the baby. That's the child. Then you've got the young and the maturing adolescent who knows him and experiences progressive victory over the world in their life. I mean, they are they are gaining ground like crazy. The kind of maturity we're talking about is the kind of maturity you see hitting young people in middle school, where they come in at, you know, at the end of fifth grade, kind of spindly and tiny. And when they come out the other end, they look a lot like young men and women. They've gained many, many inches in height. They're beginning to get, you know, um, token signs of being a young man and a young woman. Their vo- The man's voice is changing. Uh, there's clear progress being made towards becoming an, adult, uh, becoming an adult. They almost don't even really greatly resemble what they even looked like two or three years ago. This is the young maturing adolescent. They're, they're experiencing greater victory in their lives. And I'm talking about it's gaining ground. You know, they're gaining miles by the second. Then the adults, you notice if, if you're just a casual reader, you'll notice that the adults and the children sounded almost identical. Because the only thing it really says is that you know God. But the type of knowing is a different kind of knowing. The children know God in kind of a, you know, a passive kind of way, in in an immature kind of way. But the adults have a deep and more mature knowledge of God, uh, uh, which has matured and settled them over the years through continued encounters with him over a long and protracted period of time. This is a settled knowing that comes by way of repeated experience, day in and day out. The difference is similar to the way a young married couple knows each other, in uh, which is in mostly a superficial and academic way. Whereas the way married couples who have been together and actively loving each other for 30, 40, 50, or more years uh, stands worlds apart from the young, young and inexperienced marriage per, per, uh, married people. Um, the older couple has a knowing that has matured and developed over time so that they, they really don't even have um, uh, a, well, they really do deeply comprehend one another. And they're so settled into that relationship that it relies less upon words than upon experience. You just know the person. There's so much that doesn't have to be said because you know. Um, and, and, you know, in, in, a, in a young relationship, you feel the need to fill the emptiness with speech. The more settled you get in a relationship, the more comfortable you are with silence. There's not a need to say much. Uh, that's not to say that communication is greatly enjoyed in those deeper relationships, but more is said with less words uh, because they know one another. And this is the type of knowing that the fathers or the mature mothers in the faith had. Okay, So then John begins to... Uh, make a difference between knowing and loving God and loving the world, much like he explained the difference between light and dark earlier in the letter. So let's look at that, starting in verse 15, which is where we left off last week. Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in him. Now, these are all very strong statements. I mean, We've heard statements like this already at least three times since chapter one. 
If anyone says that they they do not sin, they make God a liar and God is not in them. If anyone says that they love God and yet hate their brother, they are lying and God is not in them. And here it says, if anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in them. These are very big statements. This is not saying, uh, well, that person has a pretty messed up understanding of God, but they still know him. This is saying they don't even, they've never met the guy. That's what it's saying. Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for God is not even in them. Because everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of one's lifestyle is not from the world, is not, not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away. But the one who habitually does God's will remains forever. Now, these three divisions of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, or pride of life, one's lifestyle, are not difficult to grasp. And we have many examples of them offered throughout Scripture. I'm going to use Jesus, Adam and Eve, and the parable of the sower to illustrate these three divisions as we progress. But before I do that, um, uh, and then, then we were going to, we're going to address the things which came up in our conversation at the end of last week. Um, and I'll bring it, circle back around to that in a little bit. But, uh, but before we, I show you those three divisions, illustrate the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, what they are by those examples. Uh, let me define a few terms here. Sin is here called the love of the world. So the love of the world and sin are the same thing. Love in the context of these verses, is agapio. It means to hold in esteem, indicating a direction of your will and finding one's joy in something. So, the beginning of this explanation that John is giving us would really read something like this, if I were to read that definition into it. Do not hold the world in high esteem, and do not direct your will or derive your joy from its actions or its ways. Anyone who does, the love of God is not in them. It's that clear. Not even all that hard. Do not hold the world in high esteem. Do not direct your will or derive your joy from its actions or its ways. Now, the reason for this is because ever since the fall of man, Satan has been the god of this world, not its owner, but its current lord. Therefore, the ways of the world run contrary to God's ways. The word world here is the Greek word cosmos, which means something different in English than it did in Greek. Cosmos um, means the present order and way of things. Paul refers to this earthly life as this present distress. Cosmos. It's the way and the order of the world. So do not love, do not have high esteem for, don't derive your joy from, and don't direct your will towards this present cosmos, this present distress, this, the present way of the world, its order and its doing things, right? Uh, so this passage is telling us that all that is in the world, the cosmos, the world, or all that all of the ways of this fallen age are contrary to God and his ways. It is literally a light versus dark comparison. That's why he's doing this. It's because he started off with light versus dark. Remember in chapter 1 it says, um, and this is the message that we've heard from him, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Right? Very, very, very clear and absolute statement. So he's just continuing with the the clear differences between right and wrong, good and evil, dark and light, as he progresses through this letter. He's not left that basic way of thinking. So this passage is telling us that all that is in the ways of the world are contrary to God in his ways. It is literally a light versus darkness comparison, which is why we are not to set our affections on it. This is why Galatians 5.24 tells us that those who have um, who, those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Romans 8, uh, it tells us uh, uh, not to set our attention and our affection on the things of the world. Um, our attention is often driven by our affections. Uh, we, our attention is zeroed in on the things we want. Uh, so all of these passages and several more all elucidate the same idea. 
Don't set your heart on worldly things and ways. So, those ways are divided, as I said earlier, into three categories. You've got the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So, let's look at those. The lust of the flesh. What that essentially means is things that our lower nature, including our bodies, crave. They are not things which are wrong in and of themselves, but which become wrong due to the idolatrous place it takes in our heart. Um, it supplants God. Um, in the temptations of Christ, uh, remember when Jesus was driven out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil, all three of these types of temptation came up. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh showed up when the devil said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. It was appealing to the fact that he was hungry. The lust of his lower nature. The lust of his body. Was there anything wrong with food? No. Is there anything wrong with feeding your body when it's hungry? No. Unless you have dedicated yourself for a period of time to a fast. Jesus had gone out to the wilderness, driven there by the Holy Spirit, to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. So if this was not after the 40 days to eat, would have been sin to him. And the devil knew it. So the devil was bringing temptation to him, saying, you know what, turn these stones into bread if you're really the son of God. He was appealing to his lower nature, a lust of the flesh. Adam and Eve, and all of these examples of Adam and Eve are all at the tree, um, was they, it says, it was good for food. What are they, we, wasn't that one of the, the phrase, one of the three phrases that came out their mouth in regard to their consideration of eating the fruit that they were told not to. It says that when they saw it, they considered that it was good for food, lust of the flesh. In the parables of the seed and the sower, it's the cares of this world, which grow as weeds and choke out the word of God. All of these are the lust of the flesh. When it comes to the lust of the eyes, uh, that includes things of beauty and desire. They may be riches or certain clothes or certain cars or houses or personal beauty or lust after another person's beauty. Things along that line. Things that tantalize you because of their appearance. The lust of all the eyes. Um, in the temptations of Christ, it was, I will give you all of these kingdoms if you'll bow down to me, because he spread out all the kingdoms of the world. And of course, that was the Lord's desire, was he knew that he was coming to the earth to set up a kingdom to rule and to reign over the hearts of men. And so setting all those in front of his eyes was a temptation to allure him through the lust of the eyes. Um, Adam and Eve. The fruit, you remember, says it was pleasant to the eyes. The appearance was such that they wanted to bite into it. The fruit was pleasant to the eyes. And so in the last, uh, the, the, in the parable of the seed of the sower, it was the deceitfulness of riches, a desire for things that build you up in esteem and build you up in the appearance of your own eyes and the eyes of other people. And the last one is the pride of life and uh, the things which lift that's things which lift us up in arrogance or which promise a perceived increase in value either in our own eyes or in the eyes of other people's opinion uh, anything that appeals to vanity or to pride um, in the temptations of Christ it was cast yourself down and the angels will catch you since you are really God's son it was a way of saying you know other people might could, couldn't do this but you're God's son. Prove it. Cast yourself off the top of the temple, uh, um, uh, or yeah, off the top of the temple, and uh, and um, the angels will come down and swoop and pick you up because proving to the world you are God's son. It was appeal to pride. Um, Adam and Eve. It was desirous to make one wise. Remember, those were the three phrases. It says when they looked at the fruit, the fruit, he saw that it was good for food. It was um, pleasant to the eyes and desirous to make one wise. All three sins, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Um, in the parable of the seed and the sower, it's the desire for other things other than the word. When we place something on a higher level of importance than the word of God, the desire for other things enter in and choke the word. That's the pride of life. All of these things are not of God our Father but are from the world with its broken ways and distorted values. As such, they are darkness and not light. So to love them is to love evil and hate God. 
This is why James 4.4, 4, <clears throat> a passage we're very familiar with, tells us that whoever therefore wants to be the friend of the world makes themselves God's enemy. The, the world, um, the, I'm sorry, the word friend in that passage um, uh, is very similar to the word agapio, love, that's used over there in 1 John. And it essentially means um, a relationship of knowing and trusting and, and involves the idea of adopting the interests of the world as your own personal interests. Whoever wants to be the friend of the world, whoever wants to adopt as their own the interests of the world, makes themselves God's enemy. Now, last week, in closing, we mentioned three different things. The, the, um, they came up in conversation. The first was communion and how it illustrated these truths of fellowship with God being exclusive to those who know and walk in the light of life. In other words, communion cannot be enjoyed, not just the meal of communion, but I mean, I'm talking about actual fellowship with God cannot be had by those that are walking in darkness. By extension, that also involves the actual table of our Lord, the communion that is with the, the bread and the wine, was never intended to be inclusive of people in the outside world, which is another testimony to the fact that church, the gathering together of saints in a local assembly, was never intended for the world. The, the church got off track when they started sending out flyers to non-believers and saying, join our church. Come attend our church. We were asking wolves into the sheepfold. It was a huge mistake. They were treating it as though the sheepfold was the place to win converts. And that's not where you win converts. Sheep make sheep. The shepherd takes care of the sheep. He feeds them. He grows them. He matures them and sends them out. And they, as they are at work, as they are in the marketplace, as they are at family events, as they are among friends, even friends, and I don't mean friends that you have a deep commitment to, but I mean casual people that you know, maybe from work and stuff like that. As you are around them, you are light and life to them, and you bring them into the fold quite naturally through relationship. You don't bring a person to church to get them born again. That's the most messed up thing I've ever heard in my life. And it's not scriptural. Um, and, and the early church understood this. And so having communion in the early church, it would have never occurred to them it was a problem because non-believers by and large never came. And of course, it was a little easier in the early church because the church was persecuted. So unless you were dedicated to Christ, you probably weren't going to darken the door of a church anyway, because that was to put a red, a red X on you. Um, but so, so the first thing we brought up of the three things last week is when we're talking about dark and light and all that last week, it came to three different things that came up at the end in conversation. The first of which was communion, the, the table of our Lord and how it illustrated these truths of fellowship with God being exclusive to those who know and walk in, in light. Uh, the second was how was an American Christian, uh, to vote? Meaning, should our Christian views of things such as homosexuality and abortion dictate how we cast our votes? Um, since we are light and we are living in a world of darkness, how can we expect children of darkness to live as children of light? Is it right to attempt to legislate righteous behavior through man-made and man-enforced laws? And the third thing was, uh, um, on the other hand, of the same thing concerning uh, voting and all that kind of stuff is, um, should we uh, should we do what we can to hold back the advancement of evil so that it does not engulf us and overtake us in our societies? Um, Nancy's one that kind of brought that one up at the end. Um, I believe the example being Scientology largely taking over, I think she said the Clearwater area, though I could be mistaken about that, um, because nothing was done to stop it. And it pretty much just took over. Should we as Christians do what we can within our legal means and authority and, and, and um, influence to thwart the advancement of evil? Um, so let's dive into these. But we're going to start with the second and the third one and end with the fourth one, which will involve communion if we get that far, which we might not. Um, otherwise, we'll start with communion next week. 
So let's dive in. Um, we will, be, and this was, uh, I'm, I'm doing this as much to illustrate what we've been talking about, so I don't want you to miss this. I'm not just answering questions here, though that's certainly a valid thing to do in any service, is, is if people have questions, address them. This is a good place for that, a good forum for this. But uh, I'm, but these questions are directly connected to this whole light and dark issue and how you can't have darkness you as a Christian cannot fellowship with darkness and with God at the same time. And it also has implications on who we can fellowship with in the world. So um, it's important to answer these questions. They have real life applications and they, they tell us things we can and we cannot do. So uh, uh, we're going to look at them. Um, now it's not uh, as straightforward in regarding to the whole voting thing and all that as we would like it to be. Uh, you see, you can't compare the Old Testament laws that were placed over a nation of Jewish people who all aspired to Judaism as an example for a nation like America, because America, by definition, is diversified and accepting of all religions. Uh, I think that's pretty obvious. You really can't make a apples to apples comparison between the two. I can't go back to Judaism and say, okay, well, they did this, therefore we're going to do this. Well, hold on. You know, you're comparing something that was radically different with something that we have. And that's just what, I mean, we, I've, I, we've said for years, we used to say it in this church before we knew better, that this is a Christian nation. Well, that is decidedly not true. It never has been true. Um, uh, now, our laws were largely based upon, um, believe it or not, Black's um, law book, which came from England, and it was largely taken from the Old Testament. So our, were our laws and the basic morality that drove the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and stuff like that largely based upon what we would call Judeo-Christian values? Yes, absolutely. I'm not arguing that point. It's obvious. But does that make it a Christian nation? No, no. In order for it to be a Christian nation, it would have to be a, Christ, a, a nation that's dedicated to Christ. And it never has been. From our very, very founding statements, we were inclusive of everybody from all religions, including those who had no and practiced no religion at all, but embraced atheism. We invited and included everyone. Well, you couldn't get any more different than Judaism than that. So can you see why you have a problem if you try to compare the laws that regarded that governed Judaism over America? They're different. Now, there is not a difference between the way the law those laws affect, uh, were over Judaism and the way they are over the body of Christ. Okay? Because the body of Christ is a kingdom. The Bible says that we are not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven, right? So we are, the Bible says that we are a peculiar people. The word peculiar doesn't mean that you're odd and you've got weird idiosyncrasies and stuff like that, which you might, but that wasn't what he was getting at. It, mean, it meant that you're a nation without boundaries. All nations have got physical boundaries. We go from this rock to this rock. And if you get past that rock, you now you're over in Egypt and you're no longer in the Middle East. And if you go too far over here, you're in Turkey and you're no longer here. You know, we have physical boundaries. But the body of Christ doesn't have any physical boundaries. You, uh, The body of Christ is connected in spirit and we're all over the place. Um, and so <clears throat> this is where we run into a problem is when we try to marry our real citizenship, which is in heaven, with our natural citizenship, which happens to be for you and I in America, for others it's in Africa, for other people it's in India, for other people it's, you know, wherever. You know, they're not the same thing. You're trying to marry two things that are not alike. The Bible says that flesh and blood cannot and will not inherit the kingdom of God. So there is no direct comparison between the two. That needs to be clear from the beginning, okay? I think it's kind of obvious, but I felt the need to stress the point anyway. The only other real example we have in Scripture is when Israel was in captivity. That better illustrates what we're in. Um, uh, we are strangers in a foreign land. Yeah, I was born an American. I am a citizen here as far as of natural physical birth, but I'm an alien here. Uh, I don't think like the average American. I don't have the same values as the average American. Uh, and even where our values seem similar, 
they are only similar in a superficial way. My reasons for why I feel that way are probably radically different than theirs. So, you know, <clears throat> this is not a bad comparison, but even still, it's still not really an apples to apples comparison. So, you know, but it's the only other offer, only other example we have in scripture. And again, we're trying to go to scripture to find out what's the answer to this question about how we vote and what we should do in regards to those kind of things. Um, so, uh, you know, we, when we go to scripture, we need to find some common ground. And when it comes to do with these kind of things, there's not a lot of common ground to be found. Um, uh, if you, uh, so, you know, like I said, Israel and captivity is the closest thing we've got. And that would include, believe it or not, of course, the, the positions that Jesus and the apostles took regarding politics under Roman rule, since Roman rule was, in fact, a captivity for the Jewish nation. They were in captivity in Roman rule. Um, so, um, you know, looking at how Jesus and Paul dealt with political issues, and those were those were two great examples because Jesus was not a Roman citizen, and Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. So you got both of them are under Rome. One is a Roman, and the other is a Jew in captivity in Rome. So how did they deal with their nation that they were in? Well, as I said, American cannot be run like the Jewish nation under the Old Covenant, uh, when it was a sovereign nation, since that has zero comparison with a nation where all expressions of religion or the absence of it is fully endorsed. Um, in that environment, the only way to argue for morality is on other grounds other than what is moral. Uh, it has to be something that everyone or, or mostly everyone would agree to. Now, let me explain that when I mean it has to be ar argued based on other grounds other than what is moral. As soon as you start talking about moral issues, everybody's looking for, well, what's the source of why it's moral? How do I know it's moral? I mean, who's to say it's moral? You say it's moral. Your God says it's moral. My God says, well, maybe not so much. Um, our God says you should not kill. If you happen to be a, a radical Muslim, killing is part and parcel with the religion. And he says, thou shalt do it. So who's right? Who's to say what's moral? You can't argue this based on moral ground because moral ground just creates more division. It has to be based on other ground um, when we're looking at political issues. Uh, for the child of God and trying to find common ground with people in the world and trying to to advance what we would consider Christian values. Um, so it can't be done on religious grounds. I'll give you an example. Most people would not oppose a law which respects people pro people's property. As human beings, we don't like being stolen from. So we're willing to agree that theft is wrong and is therefore punishable. That you're going to get agreement with most people in America with that law. Now, they don't believe theft is wrong because the Bible said so in most cases. They believe it's wrong because it affects them in a negative way if they're the one being stolen from. So, since they don't want to be stolen from, let's make a law and punish people when they do it. See, we have common ground, but it's for a totally different reason. Um, you know, another one is, as human beings, we generally don't like being killed. So we're willing to agree that murder is wrong and therefore is punishable. But quite literally, that's where most of our agreement begins to dissipate. Because after these things, we begin to lose common ground with the world. Uh, we, and, and we might believe uh, murder is wrong, but disagree on what is to be considered murder. Uh, for the Christian, this matter is actually decided for us from the Bible. I know that there is no specific mention um, uh, it, we're talking about, you know, because it was brought up about abortion last week, so we'll address that. I know that there's no specific men, uh, specific command which clarifies thou shalt not kill as including the unborn, but it is mentioned in other ways throughout both scripture and early Christian writings. Um, in scripture, it's both stated and implied. In Exodus chapter 21, I'm not going to turn there, but you can look it up. It's a short chapter. You can read it yourself. In Exodus chapter 21, it clearly states that if a pregnant woman is hit and it causes her to go into premature labor, but the baby is unharmed, the one who struck her must pay whatever the husband demands for endangering their child. Well, I thought it was unborn. It can't be a child. Well, the Bible seems to think it is. 
If, however, the unborn child dies, the offender was to be put to death because God saw it as murder. That settles the issue right there. The law further clarifies that if it's something between no harm at all and death, say they were born with you know a, a messed up skull where an eye was missing or a hand was damaged or a foot, that's where the passage goes on that says an eye for an eye, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot. If you damage anything on that baby, then that same damage is to be inflicted by Israel on the perpetrator, the person that hit the woman. Period. It's very clear that God sees this as a child, even though it's... The, I'll give you one better than that. Um, Hebrews 10, uh, 7, verse 10, calls children actual children while they're still in the loins of their father before they were ever in pre, um, placed in the womb of the mother. So, you know, th there really is no ambiguity in Scripture. To try to skirt it around it is really just shows ignorance of the Bible. Um, it seems pretty clear to me how God feels about this. Not to mention passages like Job 10.18 and Psalm 139.13 uh, and uh, just passages one after the other that makes it clear that God sees human beings as alive in the womb. They are genuine human beings. So for us, where the line of where murder is, is real clear. But, you know, for the world, not so much. So we have, we have, a, we have a division here. And we can't argue with them saying, well, you know, the Bible says, because they don't really care what the Bible says. So, you know, uh, so at that point, what do we do? Well, you know, before I address that, I, I want to go on and just say one more thing about this whole abortion thing. I thought it was kind of interesting. Last, last week, when uh, uh, the next day on Monday, when I often go out and uh, do my uh, physical labor outside, I, uh, um, I listened to last week's message. And uh, afterwards, I, I wanted to listen to something else. I wanted you to listen to music, which is often the case. So I, I was looking for an audio book, which I have a copious amount of. And as I was scrolling through it, I ran across the, I forgot that I had a copy of the Dadache, um, which is uh, an ancient early church father's document. It was written probably before John, the Apostle John, passed away. He was probably still alive. Um at very latest, it may have been written by 125 um, A.D., but probably within the first century. And I thought, well, you know, I haven't I haven't seen this in a long time, so I'm going to go ahead and, and listen to that real quick. Um, so I did, and I listened to it, and uh, I, I I was really kind of amazed because I I didn't remember. That's why I wanted to listen to it. It's been it's been a while since I'd listened to it, and uh, and it starts off the entire book starts off with a lot like First John talking about the way, which is what Christianity was called back then, the way. Um, and it says that the way um, is a way of light. And in it, there's no darkness. And so, and it started making comparisons between absolutes, light, darkness, evil, good, righteousness, unrighteousness, just like the book of John does, First John does, which immediately I found compelling because, you know, I wasn't even looking for this and it just stood out to me and I started listening to it and it addressed that. And then when it gets to the second chapter, now just so you know what the Dadache is, the Dadache is a composite of all the teachings of the apostles in one spot. All the major highlights of what the apostles taught. And remember, the apostles, all they did was take everything from the Old Testament and apply it to how you live this out under the New Covenant. So that's what the Dadache is. It's just a writing of a composite of all the teachings of the apostles. And it's significant that it was written while the last apostle was still alive. And he never spoke against it. And there's a tremendous amount of agreement between this book and the scriptures. It's not included in the canon of scripture. It's not on par with scripture, but it agrees with scripture. And it was interesting that in chapter 2, verse 2, you actually do have the word abortion used. And it actually says this, you are not to murder a child by abortion, nor kill them once they are born. That's word for word. You are not to murder a child by abortion, meaning that while they're in the womb, they're a child, and if you kill them, it's murder. Nor are you to kill them once they are born. Gee, that seems to fit with today's politics, doesn't it? You're allowed to kill them up to I don't know how many hours after they've been born. It's still considered perfectly fine in our messed up society. This is the kind of world that we live in whose ways are different than God's ways, which is why you don't love the world. And if anyone does love the world, the love of the Father is not in them, right? So um, 
And, you know, that, that, I mean, even if the other passages didn't speak to you, that right there in the Didache, it doesn't get any clearer than that. So how does that clear knowledge affect the way we are to vote? Is it to play a pivotal role, a secondary role, a minor role, or no role at all? Well, that is where we have difficulty, because given that all of our examples in Scripture do, do not in any way approximate the system of governance we have here in America, where we have a vote, we have to extrapolate. What would we do? What should we do? When it comes to who is in office, that becomes important because in America, the policies are attached to the person, right? Uh, you know, if you are of this political party, then, and, we're, and we're, we have more than just Republican and Democrat, though it, we might as well not because the only ones anybody really largely votes for. Um, but there's all kinds of political ideologies in America. And there's exceedingly few that have anything that comes close to agreeing with Scripture. Um, even the Republican ticket is, um, and, and constitutionalists and people like that are close, but they've got miles to go to get towards anywhere approximating righteousness. But um, but they're closer than the others. Um, and those political views, those political um, um, parties... Um, are attached to an incumbent, a person who's running for president. So the who is in office automatically applies the what is considered okay. Am I making sense? Like, in other words, if uh, most people on the Republican ticket do not agree with abortion. So the what is attached to the who, right? Um, so when it comes to who is in office, I don't believe there's any room for question. We've learned this over and over again, that God is very clear that whoever is ruling anywhere at any time, they were placed in that position by God and for his purposes. We have it in Romans 13. You go ahead and turn there if you want to. We're not going to spend a lot of time there, but I just want you to at least see the verse in Romans. And you can, I, I encourage you to read the entire chapter later on, but we're just looking at a few key verses right now for time's sake. Um, uh, we're not going to get to communion today, which I kind of expected. Um, but keep your, your stuff ready for next week, because we will go there next week unless the Lord tells me otherwise. In Romans 13, now this is going to answer some questions here, so this, uh, this is why I'm bringing this up. And again, it has to do with the light and darkness. This is real life, rubber meets the road, how do I walk out Christianity with light and darkness and all that stuff? Example right here. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Everyone must submit. Now, by everyone, that's true of everyone, but Paul was specifically writing to Christians. He says, every one of you, as Christians, must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are instituted by God. Now, that can be a tricky phrase. Back in the day, to, I didn't see it as this, but this is what I was doing, to justify my position on things, I took that phrase to mean, when it says those that exist, I meant, I thought it meant the political positions that exist, like king, potentate, um, uh, viceroy, blah, blah, blah. Those positions exist because God instituted those positions. But... This verse really doesn't allow for that interpretation. Those that exist are pointing back to a person, not a position. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. By authorities there, it's not talking about the positions, it's talking about those that fill the position. For there is no authority that except from God, and those who exist, you could say it this way, in those positions, meaning the people, were instituted or placed in that position by God. Now, lest we take these words too lightly, as if Paul were merely, again, talking about the position of ruler, rather than the specific person currently in the position of ruler, look, look, let's look at the Weymouth translation of that same verse. It says, No one is a ruler except by God's permission, and our present rulers have their rank and power assigned to them by God himself. That's pretty clear. I'll read that again. No one is a ruler except by God's permission. And our present rulers have had their rank and power assigned to them by God himself. Now, this is significant because 
you know, it's easy for people in today's world to look back on Paul and say, you know, well, that was Paul. You know, that's that's different. No, no. Well, wait a minute. You know, this was not an easy statement for Paul. Paul was saying this, uh, saying this um, in a very precarious situation. It's it's hugely significant because Paul was living under the tender, loving governance of Nero when he said this. Perhaps the most brutal ruler against Christians ever in the history of the world. Jesus essentially said the same thing to Pilate. You would have no authority over me at all, except it had been given to you from above. Notice the word you is mentioned twice. Not Rome would have no authority over me. Not your position as governor would not include power over me. But you as a person would have no power over me at all if it had not been given to you as an individual by God my Father. Those were Jesus' words. God deliberately put that person in position of authority. Now, both Paul and Jesus knew how people come into power in Rome was by three basic methods, and voting was not one of them. Either a person in Rome was placed there as a matter of succession by birth, or by civil war, or by appointment of the previous ruler. That was the only way you became a ruler in Rome. I'll give you three examples. Pilate, the one Jesus just spoke about, was born to it. Nero, who Paul was talking about, was appointed to that position by Claudius. And Julius Caesar was placed there because of civil war. Evidently, Jesus and Paul understood all three and governed and directed, they saw, they saw all three as governed and directed by God's hand of sovereign providence. If he, it didn't matter to Jesus or to Paul whether you got there because you were born to it, whether you were appointed to it, or whether you did, got there because of civil war. God's the one that controlled the circumstance and got the person in that he wanted there. Listen to that, guys. Gosh, I hope you understand how significant this is. So, would it really be that hard for God to do the same in a nation that votes its rulers into office? No, not really. Not at all. We can see how humans can manipulate the system. Do you think it's really beyond God? In fact, as I've told you many times in the past, and we've witnessed throughout Scripture in our track through the Bible, God most often brings us into the very captivity we wanted and uses either our own righteous hearts to appoint righteous leaders or our own misguided desires to bring us under misguided leadership. He always brings us into what we are focused on. Uh, and he does that to teach us, to reward us in our righteousness, or to chastise us in our sin by giving us what we want. It, it was a little surprising and delighting to me to see that Guzik, the guy that I read an awful lot, said the same thing regarding this passage. I was really kind of expecting he was going to go in another direction with it. I'd never looked it up before. Um, I, I did this time. And he said regarding the phrase, no authority except from God, he said, God appoints a nation's leaders, but not always to bless the people. Sometimes it is to judge the people or to ripen a nation for judgment. Where, where have you guys heard that before? I didn't get it from Guzik. I got it from studying, which is where Guzik got it too. He said the exact same thing that I said, or really... I guess I'm really saying the same thing he said because he wrote that long before I did. But now let's back up, uh, back up and look at verse chapters. Uh, I guess not back up and go forward. Look at verses five through seven as we're closing here in First John. Um, it says, "I'm sorry, in Romans 13. I'm sorry, Romans 13. Forgive me, Romans 13, verses five through seven. I'm skipping through two past two through four because it deals with an issue I just don't feel like dealing with right now. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that in a minute, but in verse 5 through 7, it says, Therefore, you must submit not only because of wrath, because God's going to smack you on the head if you don't, but also because of your conscience. As a child of God, your conscience should be telling you to submit to these authorities. For this reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's public servants continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those who owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, not to those who earned it, but those to you owe it to, and honor to those you owe, to those you owe honor to. Now, I skipped over verses 2 through 4 for a reason, because it mentions that these rulers are given to us for our good. 
This does not necessarily mean for our praise, but perhaps for our judgment, correction, and instruction. So, for our good doesn't mean that it always looks good to you and I. Sometimes, God places a person in position of authority who will bring the church into bondage on purpose, because we have been living ungodly lives, and so he just brings us into captivity to the very world we were claiming to love. And so we get into trouble. Um, and as such, uh, he it doesn't look good to you and I, but it is for our good. So it's kind of a subjective way of looking at it, but it is it, that's the way, I mean, if we look at it, if we look at good as meaning what we interpret as good, well, that's too subjective, and you won't understand what the passage is saying. Now, uh, so what implications does that make on our voting? Let me just close this out real quick. In my opinion, very little. Since in our nation, the parties have become so polarized as to make which side best represents light and which best represents darkness pretty clear. Um, so the result of either a good leader or a bad leader in terms of morality is largely connected to the party and the party is connected to the person running. So if God is the one who unilaterally places a leader in office, then all of the issues regarding the specifics of moral leanings of one administration versus another becomes very little uh, of very little importance because God's going to place the one he wants in there anyway. And so whatever political leading they have is going to be established because God placed them there. So knowing that, does it matter how we vote? Well, yes and no. No, in that our vote has no direct influence or vote uh, veto power over God's choice. You can't veto God. I got news for you. And you're not going to influence him either. He's the one that influences other people. Yes, in that it is a way in which we give our testimony and we express our allegiance. So, it yes, in that we need to vote our conscience. What is right, what we see morally is true. Um, and that has to do with who we place into office. Uh, as far as voting on issues, not on people, but on issues regarding things like the LGBT stuff and matters of abortion, um, as regards lifestyles and stuff like that, I don't believe we have a right to limit people's freedom of expression, meaning they're, if they want to be a homosexual, God doesn't even stop them from being a homosexual. So do we, should we through our vote try to limit their freedoms? Only to the degree that their freedoms might take over an area, like the example that Nancy gave. Um, I, Terry and I witnessed that in St. Pete the other day. Um, but we should not try to force our belief system on someone else, making it impossible for them to sin without legal ramifications. There's nothing in Scripture that supports that. Uh, let me clarify. I do not believe a Christian should deny a, a social service to someone just because they're gay. If they want to buy a cake, for goodness sake, freaking let them. You're not sanctioning their sin. It's a cake, for God's sake. You know? On the other hand, to lead them in matrimony is a different issue altogether. Because now you're participating in a union between two people that God doesn't bring together and doesn't recognize. Can you see the difference between the two? So if there were a law on the ballot that that was going to try to force ministers to marry people who are um, uh, homosexuals, I would say that the Christian vote should be very clear. No, you don't. You can't force someone to participate in another person's sin. But baking a cake for someone, then paying for it, is a matter of. I mean, if I were if I were a grocery store owner, I'm not going to sit there the checkout and find out. Okay, are you a Christian? Okay, well, I'll sell to you. You're, you're not a Christian? Oh, no, no. You got to put those vegetables back on the, 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 the shelf because I am not going to let you buy vegetables in my store because you're not a Christian. Come on, really? Grow up. Let's use some common sense. Uh, they have a right to eat. Uh, they have a right to celebrate things in their own life. And if that requires buying a cake or getting some flowers, let them. Um, you're not participating and sanctioning their sin in doing so. Are you seeing what I'm saying? There's a difference between the two. The big issue that should help us see this is that what we vote and how we vote is really not about them. It's about you and your conscience. 
So voting against any law which would seek to force someone to officiate over a wedding against their conscience is altogether different than voting against them having a right to have a wedding at all. I don't care if homosexuals want to have a wedding. Knock yourself out. You're already sinning. What's, 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 you're not, you're not going to stop them from doing it. So why, why are we all caught up and getting up in their grill and trying to tell them what they can and they cannot do in their life and legislate that? That God, like I said, God doesn't even do that. He gives people a free will. So why are we trying to play God and take their free will from them? I don't agree that that's right. Um, I, I don't, you know, for me as a minister, I don't marry anyone. So it's a non-issue to me. Um, I'm not discriminating since I won't conduct a marriage, period. Um, I've had friends ask me to officiate over a wedding and I said, no, I don't do weddings. Uh, for me, it's a matter of conscience. I don't know with perfect knowledge who God wants with whom. So who am I to lead a marriage that leads these two together to be joined together if I don't even know what God's will is regarding these people? So I just don't even get involved. Besides that, there's no biblical basis for ministers being officiators over weddings at all. You realize that there is not a single example of a minister conducting a wedding in the entire Bible. It's not there. So it's not even a scriptural issue. So I see no issue, to, uh, reason to get involved. Um, so, but how does this affect issues like abortion in regards to a Christian vote? Well, people are going to murder their children for any manner of justifications one way or the other. And denying them the ability to do it by governing sanction won't stop them. However, as I said regarding aberrant lifestyles, sexual lifestyles, our vote is not so much about them as it is about us. It is inconsistent for a Christian to claim that murder is only murder if it's after birth. And so, as a matter of testimony and conscience, we should vote against it. Um, you need to keep in mind, your vote will not take their free will away from them. And I doubt very seriously in our nation, abortion will ever be treated as murder of an innocent life as it should be. So all your vote stands to do is express your conscience and perhaps make it more difficult for a person to commit murder. But other than that, it's really not going to change much. So true Christians will never see eye to eye with non-believers. And even in areas where we might appear to agree, like regarding stealing or whatever, are barely skin deep. Uh, our, ours is due to submission to the character and the ways of God, and theirs is because it benefits them. Um, so there's it, to them, it's largely a matter of practicality. So there's no common ground for fellowship between the world and the Christian, which makes this voting issue a little on the tricky side. So um, to summarize real quickly, you, you should vote your conscience without question. Your conscience should lead you in the direction of, of not making it completely impossible for a person to commit sin unless it's something that's already seen as generally understood as wrong, like murder or theft or something like that. Um, but beyond that, uh, I don't think that we should try to pass laws that make it impossible for a person to get married if they're homosexual or buy a cake or or whatever, I really think that we're going way beyond the pale. And when we do that, we create the kind of hostility that we have right now in the LGBT community, which is why they've tried to force down our throat not only compliance and acceptance, but participation, because we've made them angry. And I don't know that their anger isn't really misplaced. We had no right to tap dance on their rights. You know, keep your, keep your hands off of it. It's really not your place. So, uh, with that having been said, I'll, 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 I'll close out today. Uh, we'll, we'll start dealing with um, the things that lead up to communion next week. So, I open the floor to anyone who has a, a statement or a question, because uh, what I said today may just have created even more questions, which is fine. So, I open the floor to you. I did create some questions. I've got one just, you're talking about um, with the letting people live their lives as they choose. If you have a couple, a gay couple, and they go to an adoption agency where you are there to facilitate adoptions and they want to adopt, mm -hmm. you say, okay, that's all right. Go ahead. It doesn't bother me at all. I didn't say that you tell them that it doesn't bother you. I'm well, saying... You, how do you deal with it? Let me put it that way. Okay. The way that you deal with it is based on what the law says, period. 
Um, if you are an employee there, you do what you're told. If you don't, they'll fire you and they'll do it anyway. So it, it, in that regard, it makes, it, let's, let's dial it back and consider that all sin is sin. There's not degrees of sin. I mean, there is in some regards, but in largely it's all worthy of death. It's, it's all the same thing. Um, do uh, try to apply it to something simple like being a cashier. A homosexual comes through your line and wants to buy, uh, for, forgive me for being, um, blunt here, but let's just say they want to buy a condom. Well, you already know they're sex, they're, they're sexually active in the gay community and they're clearly buying that for engaging in activity that you don't agree with. Do you check them out and let them buy it? Do you have a right yes. to deny sale? No, you don't have a right to deny sale. Well, apply that to the other. You really don't have a right. Um, now, when it comes to do with our vote um, and saying, is it okay for a, um, a homosexual to adopt a child? You're going to have to argue this on other grounds other than Scripture. Because Scripture does not fly in our nation. We are not living in Judaism in you know the Old Testament. We're living in America that we claim is accepting of all beliefs. So we would have to argue it on other grounds. And by the way, there is a great argument to be made. The problem is that it will never see the light of day because the left is suppressing it. There's a lot of studies that came out in the 70s and the 80s that proved that having a mother and a father was the only healthy environment for a child, and that if a child is grown up and reared in an environment where there's homosexuality involved, it literally causes aberrant behavior and acting out and um, all kinds of psychological, psychological issues for this child later on in life. It's not a guess. It's known. It's been demonstrated and illustrated by testing and by observation. But like I said, those studies have been suppressed, and I guarantee if you try to Google it, you'll probably never find it. But they exist. Um, if we could resurrect those and prove on a moral level that, meaning the morality of this world, that because we, it's all about the children, which it really isn't, but that's what they buy into, so let's just play into it. If it really is all about the children, should we allow this because studies have shown? Are you seeing where the logic goes? Okay, so if you want to argue on that level, then and and if and there are people in this in in the body of Christ who probably God has made it their mission and their goal to research these things and to make that kind of information available. So you could argue on those grounds, but um, but you couldn't just. I would I would say that it's unwise for a child of God to go in there and try to change it just purely because we understand it is sin. Um, right, and, because God says honor your mother and father. He didn't say honor your two daddies, honor your two mommies. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, so, uh, so that having been said, I, I hope that answers your question. I mean, if you are being employed and your employer is asking you to do something that maybe it wouldn't be it wouldn't be wrong for you to do, like selling said uh, thing at uh, you know at, at a store, um, uh, isn't wrong necessarily. Um, but if your conscience bothers you, find another job. Yeah, um, because you just said earlier, those authority, you submit to those. Yes. If you're under their authority, then you have to be submissive to that authority. Like I said, otherwise, get another job. That's right. Or someplace, you know, what you're wanting to see come about. That's exactly right. I mean, there's certain things that we cannot fudge on. Like the New Testament, it was very clear that when the um, the government, and in this case it was the Jewish government, was coming in and telling the apostles, you will no longer preach in Jesus' name. They have no right to tell them that. And even if they did have a right to tell them that, you preach anyway because a higher power told you to preach. We do not have a higher power that's told us to disobey laws regarding moral issues. doesn't say that. And so, you know, so uh, there are where, places where we draw the line. And those lines have been made clear as to where they are in Scripture because we have examples. But as I've said before, Paul and the early apostles and John, uh, Jesus lived in a society that, um, that embraced aberrant lifestyles and many sexual um, uh, lifestyles so much that it makes America look tame by comparison. I mean, we literally are a paragon of virtue in America compared to ancient Rome. 
I mean, you haven't seen the basement yet. Not on the level that Jesus walked around every day and saw. And yet uh, Christians today get indignant and say things you never hear coming out of Jesus' mouth. And he was surrounded by things that made today's stuff pale by comparison. So we have to regulate, you know, reevaluate ourselves in the light of what we see Jesus and Paul doing in a situation that was much worse than ours. So yeah, uh, think of the demoniac. He was running around naked. Jesus saw that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He, after he cast the demon out, he sought to clothe him, but um, he didn't rebuke him. You know, he didn't rebuke the man, he rebuked the demon. <laughs> so, sure. yeah. Sure. So, um, and, 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 and let me be clear as well, everybody. We're going to run into things that I don't have an answer to because I don't know everything. And we may run into things that might tweak current answers because we have more knowledge. That's fine. I have no problem being wrong. All I can give you is the knowledge that I have based on the, what I've seen so far in Scripture. It would only take one verse to cause me to reevaluate things. And that's fine. And if you think you've got one, send it my way because I can use it. But um, up to this point, this is what I see in scripture. So, but I'm not above being challenged. So you get that. I think you guys understand that. So and anybody else have a thought? Yeah. Um, what is the difference? What is the difference between going to get somebody's will, I guess, and advocating what they're doing? I mean, if I bake a cake for a gay couple or whatever, they're going to think that I advocate what they're doing. Well, what, what? But you're saying to go ahead and bake it because I don't have the right to go against their will. No, what, what I'm saying I, what I'm I, saying I, is I don't mind them. It's a crossing and being confusing. No. What, what I'm saying is that take this back to, like I said, gave the example with, with doors, which I didn't like use that example, but I, th I thought was more apropos. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to deny sale to a homosexual um, who's buying groceries at a grocery store. What are they going to do? They're probably going to go home and cook that food for their gay partner. Or they might be having a gay party. They might be having a toga party with other gay people with those vegetables that I'm selling. Should I deny sale? No. Who am I to deny sale to these people? Are you following what I'm saying? I'm not saying yeah, by sell. Yeah. I'm not saying by selling it. I'm saying I agree with your lifestyle. I'm saying thank you for your money. Have a nice day. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> now I also said you need to follow your conscience. If your conscience condemns you for baking the cake, we know this on scriptural grounds. The Bible says that you that a weaker brother might might view um, you know eating meat as being wrong. You and I both know eating meat is not wrong. Jesus even did it, right? Um, God commanded Noah, kill and eat. I've given it to you as food, just like the green herb. So we know it's not wrong, but some Christians, it might bother their conscience. And so what did Paul say to the people It bothers their conscience? He says, don't do it. Don't go against your conscience. Not because it's actually right or wrong, but it's wrong for you because your conscience is telling you it's wrong. So in that case, what you need to do is reevaluate what line of work you're in or pray that God gives you um, non-gay people or that people come in and buy a cake if they're gay and they don't tell you that they're gay. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, you know, you're going to have to work within the framework of your own conscience. But as far as what I'm dealing with is whether it's actually right or wrong. And in the same way that it's not wrong to eat meat, it's not wrong to sell something to someone that is comes from a different lifestyle of you. The new, it, it's no more wrong to sell a cake to a homosexual than it is to sell a carrot to an atheist. Both of them probably don't know God. And that's the real issue. They're out of fellowship with God. What the particular sin that they're committing is, is of little relevance. Neither one of them are children of God. As such, do I have a right just because they're children of the devil to deny them sale? Probably not. I think we're we're kind of on a skating on super thin ice. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I know don't get me wrong. Does it sucker punch me in the gut too? Because I hate it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But you know what? That just requires me to grow up and say, you know what? They're another human being. Love them. Don't love what they do, but love them. God may open the door to to uh, to to to, uh, to say something, and nothing about the transaction says that you can't verbalize that you're a Christian, and that uh, 
Um, and as a Christian, uh, you, you, you love them as another person and that you're praying for them. I don't know that I would point out unless the Lord told me to, oh yeah, by the way, you're, you're, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. Probably not the best, you know, thing to say. The Lord might tell you to. There are times when Jesus didn't pull punches. I mean, he came out and just called a spade a spade. Other times, um, it was mostly the goodness of God that led people to repentance, right? Uh, you have to be led. So, you know, you're always going to be a testimony of Christ. And, uh, you know, who knows, but that that person, because of the way that you acted, might be uh, convicted in their heart. But if all you do is get angry and send them away, I can guarantee you, now all they feel is justified in their position. So, uh, uh, any other any other thoughts from anyone? No, no, but don't talk, I'm sorry, talking about that particular issue, Hobby Lobby came out against... Um, them having to provide insurance mm -hmm. for abortion. Mm -hmm. They won. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they don't... Uh, it's it's one of those things that um, they stood up, they tried, yeah. they they got their, their point across, and they do not have to pay insurance for people to have abortion. There you go. Okay. So there's, there's times that it that you you do stand up, mm -hmm. and there's times that you don't. Yeah, and, and that um, as that, a as an independent, let's say um, there you go. baker, you have got the right to say yes, I want to bake for you. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. But if you are employed at Publix or Walmart or Sam's, you don't. You don't have that choice. That's right. You order the cake, I'll make the cake. Mm -hmm. I don't have to like making the cake, yeah. but I make the cake. That's right. So, and there's a, a lot of um, crisscross um, confusion, confusion from, from one aspect to the other. Agreed. And um, it's... Um, you know, it's, it's like when I was talking about uh, Clearwater, I'm not saying that people should go in there with signs of protest. Yeah. I'm yeah. just saying that the people that were there just kind of, oh, no. this is creepy, and backed away. Yeah. Where they, Lord, probably would have had them stay and be a testimony. Be, you know, yeah. be who they're yeah. supposed to be. Yeah. So I think um, you you look at at places and um, you see that happening in little pockets, mm -hmm. even in businesses. Little little um, they're like, oh, this is there's Christians that work there, so don't even apply there unless you're a Christian. Well, that's not that's not true. Yeah, but yeah. Um, it it gets. I don't know. It gets a little crazy in there. It does. And uh, the, I'm glad you brought up the example of uh, um, Hobby Lobby and what they did, because there's a difference between voting on a law across the board for the nation and what you do as a company. Because what they're asking them to do is play party to something that they are, they see as sin, which of course it is. By um, by doing that. Now, if the law required all businesses to do it, that would give Hobby Lobby an out because at that point, they don't have a choice. But as long as they have a choice, and this is part of the beauty of a free nation or what is at least partially a free nation, is you, like you said, they gave it a go. They gave it a try to see whether or not it would stand up in court, and it did. And uh, and the same thing is true. I'll just throw this out here real quickly. is with uh, with uh, health care for homosexuality, uh, homosexuals. A lot of this stuff has been suppressed by the homosexual community. You, we learned a long time ago that AIDS is the only disease on the planet that actually has rights. You cannot ask a person if they have it. Now, you could ask them if they have everything else in the world, but you can't ask them that. And the, the reason why that came about was because of the fact that AIDS is something that is not that difficult to contract. And, and those people who have AIDS ha are at a higher risk of infections and all kinds of things. And so if I, as an employer, want to cover someone who has AIDS, 
or a person who is in a homosexual lifestyle, which makes them many times more prone to getting or contracting AIDS, then I automatically are going to increase insurance for everyone else because they're going to be making a ton more claims than this guy over here. Now, if we were talking about any other topic but homosexuality and AIDS, this would be understood. If I go to an insurance company and I have got a weak heart and I've got this and I've got that, I've got pre-existing conditions, then they're like, you know what? Hey, I'm sorry, we're not going to insure you. You're too high of a risk. You could argue it based on the same grounds for homosexuals and people with AIDS. But we can't argue that because they've suppressed the data. So like I was saying earlier, you if you could resurrect that data and argue it based on something that is pure facts and not based upon a moral code, you might could do something. But if it's just purely based upon morality, you'll never get to go anywhere. Okay, anybody else have a thought before we close? It went longer than I wanted to today, but I, I, I think that it was still good. All right, so we'll go ahead and, and, and close. Great. Grace. Grace. Grace.